everybody, it's Ms. Bresnahan here, and I'm going to talk to you about evolution. Um, first of all, the definition of evolution is the change in the genetic composition of a population over time. And there are two main levels to, um, to how evolution can occur, microevolution and macro. There are three main processes. Uh, there's artificial selection, which humans do. There's natural selection, which occurs in the environment. And there is, uh, there's random processes as well, um, and we will talk about five random processes by which um, genetic composition can change. And the big thing is here is that evolution causes biodiversity. It causes um, more variety in genes, causes more variety in the types of species, and it also causes uh, biodiversity on the large level uh, with our ecosystem diversity. Uh, first of all, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, taxonomic rank. Uh, so we have going out from a large category of, of organisms, kingdom, and then phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species, species being the most specific um, category there. Uh, if we look at our economic rank as Homo sapiens, uh, we, have, um, we are part of the animal kingdom. Uh, we have a, uh, a spinal cord. So we are part of the uh, chordata family, or phylum, excuse me. We are mammals, uh, so we're in the class mammal. We are primates, that is our order. We are hominids as a family, and our genus is homo, and our species is sapiens. And so when we uh, express and we write the, uh, the taxonomic rank or the taxonomy of an organism, we would write for humans, we would write Homo sapiens. And that's even if you're talking about a singular form. All right, so looking at this, uh, how we sort of branch off here, uh, looking at our super family, family, we have subfamilies, we have sort of divisions within each of these ranks. Um, but if we go down, we have super family, and then there are two families uh, there, and then we have subfamilies, we have tribe, and then finally we have a genus here. And we are closely related to some, uh, some species that exist right now, uh, the gibbon and the gorilla. Uh, we have really close cousins of the pan genus, and that includes bonobo and chimpanzees. Phylogenetic trees, um, so that was not a phylogenetic tree. This is a phylogenetic tree, and the way that you read this is you look at the last organisms on the tree, and those are the organisms that exist today, current living species. And you're looking through time, where back in time we have a less diverse population in the past, and then going to our current population um, from. So let's just look to see how this is set up here. If we look at this, all of these different types of organisms, we have a common ancestor and then we have a branch point. And so that branch point indicates where speciation, a new species evolved. Um, one species gave rise to a new one. That's what we're gonna talk about how that happens. Um, so it branches off and then we have the Lancelot which, which still exists today, but it is a really or, old, excuse me, genetically, uh, genetically speaking, a really old organism. So it branched off at some point in time in the past, and a lot of these phylogenetic trees actually will indicate the actual time or how many millions of years ago this occurred. The branch point occurred, and it splits off into vertebrates now. And so we have the lamprey, and it has related cousins here, and so this shows closeness uh, genetically. And now we have hinged jaws. So common ancestor of the trout, lizard, and chipmunk would be right here. So this is an organism that had existed in the past that no longer exists now, but it gave rise to these other species um, in using processes of evolution. So we have legs, we have mammary glands here um, evolving as well. And so a phylogenetic tree, again, shows how, um, how species evolve over time and from what ancestor or ancestral line do they come from. There's two levels of evolution. There's microevolution and macroevolution. Micro, anything micro means small. Anything macro means large. There's microeconomics um, and macroeconomics. 
And so just always know that when you're hearing those prefixes, we're talking about two different levels of things. So microevolution is below the species level. This is when there is the evolution of different varieties of things. Um, and so we kind of think about food or crops. Um, and so it, different varieties of pumpkins, all of these different colors, all of these different types. They're all pumpkins. They're all of that same species, um, but they are different varieties. And so that would be microevolution. Macroevolution occurs when there is enough genetic change where a new species um, actually starts to, or doesn't start to, a new species arises. And then even more evolution occurs where a new genera, family, class, or phyla arises as well. And we talk about new species forming and we use the word speciation. So speciation means the evolution of a new species. And we cannot have the evolution of genera or families without that evolution of the species first. So it works from bottom up. All right. So in order to understand how evolution works, we really need to understand a little bit about genetics. So I'm going to give you a quick um, overview of genetics and how this plays a part in evolution. And we really need to know this in, in environmental science because if if we don't know about evolution, then we really cannot understand how, um, how humans impact ecosystems and how one ecosystem can, can change over time due to the, the changing in genetic composition or species diversity. So genes are physical locations on chromosomes within cells of an organism. And genes have DNA that codes for different traits and those traits could be shown, they could be like eye color, body size, anything about physiology, um, or they could be about how the individual processes chemicals or foods. Um, there are alleles, which are different forms of DNA, and then also genotypes. So a genotype is a complete set of genes in an individual. And so if you think about it in terms of, of humans, you have genes and your entire genotype is every single gene and every single cell. Um, and that includes all of the genes that were passed down from both of your parents. The genotype is the complete set of genes and the phenotype is the actual set of traits expressed in that individual. Um, what is actually there, what's shown on the outside. Um, but we do have some genes that, that we still exist in our chromosomes, but they're not expressed. Um, so in biology, we learn about dominant versus recessive genes. So there's genes that you carry with you, and then there's genes that actually are expressed. So a phenotype cannot exist in, unless the genotype is there. So I have um, in the background here in the juice aisle in a grocery store, there's all of these juices available. That would be genotype, every single thing that is available. But what you put in your shopping cart or what you put in your basket and then you take away out of the store would be what you're actually using. That would be your phenotype. Uh, so phenotype can be determined by environment and also genotype. So um, if we think about an example of a water flea, so the body shape of a water flea is largely dependent upon whether or not there is the smell or the chemical presence of predators while that water flea is, um, is being incubated in its environment. And so if there are no predators in the environment, then the water flea will end up having small heads and short spines. But if there are predators present, then the water flea will end up having large heads, large spines. However, this comes at a cost. So it can avoid predators, but if it has large heads and large spines, now it has a slower uh, reproduction rate. So there's a cost to that. So that's not necessarily what happens a lot of times if there's no predator present. Um, a lot of times they'll just have a small head, short spine, then they can reproduce quickly. And so um, the predator's present is, or in the environment is going to change um, what phenotype ends up um, being expressed using the genotype there. And this happens a lot um, with, with siblings too. So if you have the same parents as a sibling, then um, you might not have the same phenotype as your sibling, but the same genotype is there. Um, and that ends up, uh, maybe that ends up in the womb. There are certain environmental factors that may cause uh, phenotype to be expressed. So how is genetic diversity in a population created? 
So the genes available must change in some way. And so they may change uh, through, re I should say that they do change through recombination. So whenever there is um, cell division occurring and genes are being copied, they get copied in different combinations and different varieties end up being, being shown in a population. A genetic mutation can occur as well. Um, and so a genetic mutation occurs when, um, when DNA is being copied, uh, there's a random mistake that occurs there. And so this random mistake causes um, the, the original uh, genetic code to actually change um, due to this random, this random thing that occurs. So again, it is random. It can be produced when a mistake occurs, uh, when DNA is being copied during the process of cellular, uh, cellular division. And so here's an example of these birds where normally they are green, but sometimes a mutation occurs that causes them to have this, uh, this blue appearing feather. And so then what ends up happening is if the blue one does, and does, um, does mate and it passes on that gene, that now mutated gene is now part of the genotype. And this creates some biodiversity in a population. And it can occur due, due to environmental factors um, as well. So it's not necessarily just, just a mistake in copying, but things like high energy radiation can change, um, can change DNA. And this can, this can cause mutations as well. Some mutations are detrimental. And uh, a lot of times this is the way that it happens. It makes um, individuals more conspicuous, in, or excuse me, more conspicuous, and it makes them to be spotted more by predators. And so this causes them to be less likely to survive and reproduce. But there are favorable mutations as well. And so these mutations can improve a chance at survival. And then if it improves the chance of survival, then it improves the chance that that, uh, that organism can reproduce. And then what will happen with that gene? Now that gene will be passed on to the offspring. And now we have that new added genetic diversity in the population. And so an example of a mutation that actually is favorable uh, to survival is um, some, some mosquitoes uh, possess this um, this gene where they um, really are not affected by insecticides. And so if they are less, um, less affected by insecticides, then those ones can, can survive, they can reproduce. And now we have this increased uh, population of, of mosquitoes that really are not affected by, by these chemicals. There's two processes of evolution. And I wanna state that, so, Evolution itself, the fact that genes change in a population over time, um, this, is, this is something where we've seen this forever. I and mean, we can watch it happen with fruit flies. Um, we can watch it happen with mice. Genes change over time. Um, and so when, uh, when Charles Darwin um, said that, okay, things, you know, genes change over time, the question is in the science realm is, okay, how does it happen? And so we're going to talk about the processes and the mechanisms of evolution. And there's three processes, but random processes includes five. So we have artificial selection and we have natural selection. And I grouped those together in red to show you that these are, these are similar in a way where they require a variation in traits that are capable of being inherited by the next generation. Um, and that variation in traits allows that organism to survive and reproduce. Um, but random processes are processes that do not necessarily change the adaptability of an organism, um, but are just completely random and end up changing the diversity, the genetic diversity. So the first process of evolution that I want to talk about is evolution by artificial selection. And this is when a desirable trait is forced by humans on a population by selecting organisms that are the ones that reproduce or by selecting genes to insert into a population so then that gene continues to be passed on. And so we can do this intentionally. We can intentionally basically force the hand of evolution by selectively breeding domesticated animals um, or agriculture, um, animals such as cattle, sheep, or um, using selective breeding with dogs. Um, we can also really increase the rate of evolution by using GMOs or genetically modified organisms. And one example of a GMO is 
So we, we recognize a gene in an organism and take that gene and then copy it into an organism that would not normally have that gene. And so in agriculture, um, there, there's a bacteria that is a natural, that naturally repels insects. And um, that bacteria, we can take that gene, that is that insect repelling gene, and then insert that gene into a crop plant. So that now that crop plant that has that gene naturally uh, resists, uh, resists insects. And so then that allows um, to reduce the amount of insecticide that is used on that crop. And there is many examples of, of GMOs that we will go over in class as well. Um, so the, there's other, other uh, sort of like ways that we force the hand of evolution um, unintentionally. And one example of that is in the fishing industry where we fish the largest adults, let's say cod, we fish the largest ones. Um, and so that leaves the smaller ones uh, to reproduce. And so we reduce the genetic diversity because those that do reproduce now have the gene where they have smaller bodies and those genes get, get passed on. All right, so here's a phylogenetic tree showing artificial breeding of, of dogs and all coming from the wolf. So all of the, the dog breeds that we have today are variations of, of a one gray wolf uh, species. And they have all diverted um, off of that, off of that part of the tree. And the reason that the wolf is not down here towards the bottom of the tree, but instead at the top, is because the wolf is still an existing species. And again, this goes by time. So we have current time at the top, and we have uh, past um, underneath here. So it shows that yeah, it branched off here, but that wolf still exists today. Uh, we can also artificially select plants. Um, so one example of that is the wild mustard. And we have artificially selected to produce things like Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, broccoli, head cabbage, kale, and kohlrabi. And these are not natural variants. These are all artificially selected variants. There's also evolution by natural selection. And we use the idea of natural selection to do artificial selection. So natural selection is when the environment determines which individuals uh, survive, and then reproduce. The reproducing part is really important because that is what is going to cause that gene to be passed on. So natural variation in genotypes, uh, this causes individuals who are better to survive or better able, excuse me, to survive and reproduce to pass on those traits to the next generation. Natural selection favors any combination of traits and it allows anything that improves an individual's fitness, its ability to survive and reproduce, it allows that those traits to then be passed on. So if we just look at this cartoon example here, we have a variation in a population. It's the same exact species, but the phenotype varies. And so this one is able to reach the food. Okay, so it survives. And then what ends up happening is adaptation. So then it passes on that gene in a population, passes on the gene. We have a new population now um, that has the longer legs and is able to reach the, um, the, the food source. Natural selection became synthesized into a theory by Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, who lived from 1823 to 1913. Um, he is the lesser known of the two, um, Charles Darwin being the other one, who, is, who was a naturalist on the HMS Beagle, uh, which was a British surveying ship, and he lived from 1809 to 1882, and he is more famous probably because he uh, wrote On the Origin of Species, by means of natural selection, um, and that was published in 1859. And this was not a widely accepted idea at the time um, at all, and so this would really challenge some current dogma at the time, but now um, widely accepted and, um, and then also proven using, using genes. So key ideas on the origin of species by natural selection, um, individuals produce an excess of offspring, and not all of those offspring can survive. Uh, the individuals, they differ in traits. The difference in traits can be passed on from parents to offspring. And then the differences in traits are associated with differences in the ability to survive and reproduce. And so the other sort of phrase that is used here um, with, with natural selection is survival of the fittest. And so what that means is that those who have the more favorable traits in an environment are going to be the ones that that survive. And I don't really like the word fittest because we kind of associate that with being fit. And we talk about that in terms of like health and maybe like people who go to the gym 
and work out. Um, and so those people are fit. That's different. Um, being fit in the environment means that you can survive. Okay. So these are organisms that maybe they can survive actually because they aren't big and strong. Maybe they can survive because they are nimble and they can um, easily uh, traverse uh, small branches or small twigs and they can escape predators. And so there are different ways, um, different solutions to the game of survival. Um, and it's not necessarily being big and strong. There are other ways too. Uh, so an adaptation is a trait that improves an individual's fitness. And there are multiple solutions to a particular environmental challenge. And so in the desert, there are challenges uh, about water availability. And so different plants have the same exact problem, but they have different adaptations to solve that problem. So it might be these hairs that reduce water loss, or it could be um, a waxy surface that reduces water loss. And it could be a succulent that holds and stores that water. It could be really long tap roots that are able to uh, go deeper into the soil column and really access that, that water better than, um, than surface level roots. Um, so adaptations end up being passed on from generation to generation. If we look at this diagram on the left, we have parents, the first generation. Um, and in this, these are crustaceans and the parents produce offspring that vary in body size. So here's our offspring here. And we have, some of them are crossed off. These are the ones that don't survive. Why? They're larger. They can be seen easier by the fish. They're easily predated. And so now we have parents, the second generation, we have a large one, we have a small one. And now we've added um, some genes here. Now we have three produced that are small, one produced that is larger. Now we're really taking out that, um, that genotype from the population that, can, that codes for this, the larger body type. And then the third generation, we have smaller crustaceans that, um, that aren't easily seen by, by the cod. All right, so that's basically the process of natural selection. The ones that, um, that can survive do survive, and those ones that do survive are able to reproduce. Those ones that do not survive in an environment are not able to reproduce um, and pass on those genes. Uh, there are also random processes, things that had, do not have anything to do with adaptation, things that um, do not relate to differences in fitness. Um, however, what they do include is a change in genetic composition over time, okay? This is evolution, change in genetic composition in a population. And so one random process that I already mentioned before is mutation. So if a mutation isn't lethal and it increases the chance of survival and reproduction, then it's going to um, transpire down the line of, of uh, passing on that gene and it will increase genetic diversity over time. Gene flow is another, um, a way that uh, evolution can occur, and it's totally random because it doesn't have to do with adaptation. And so gene flow occurs uh, whenever we have individuals moving from one population to another, and it changes the composition of the population that they left, and it changes the composition that they went to um, genetically. And so this can be forced as well, and we see this example of this happening um, in Florida. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, introduced some Texas panthers to Florida. And they did that because, so the population in Florida at the time, they had this kink tail. And the kink tail isn't a problem, but it was associated with those who had the kink tail also had a heart defect. And they wanted to introduce new genetic diversity into the population. So the population was so small, and then it kept um, causing this, this heart defect to become more and more prevalent in the population. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife introduced some panthers from Texas into the Florida population. And then after breeding occurred, then it introduced that, that gene into the diversity. Um, and then the, in the end, the heart defect um, ended, up, ended up decreasing. Um, and one important lesson here is that when a population is isolated, this decreases the genetic variance, um, and this causes, um, this causes inbreeding to occur, and this results in a homozygous, meaning all one type of gene, um, and that could be an unfavorable gene, um, and, it, and then in the end, it'll, it'll decrease the population size, and it could lead to extinction. So that's really why the U.S. Fish and Wildlife introduced the Texas panther to Florida is because they were trying to avoid the extinction of the, the Florida panther. Um, 
And this is really important isolation um, with environments that we create today. We really do create this island effect. We isolate organisms. Um, we put in roadways and infrastructure and put in different types of environments where organisms populations can't cross from one place to the other. They become more isolated and inbreeding occurs. And if an environment environmental change occurs and it isn't favorable to that population, well, they only have one type of gene to be able to deal with it. So if they can't deal with the, with the environmental change, then it's going to cause um, possible extinction and definitely a reduction in population size. So genetic drift is also a random process because it's not adaptive, um, but it does cause um, genetic diversity to, to change. So this is when the genetic composition of a population changes over, a time, over time due to random mating. And this is significant more in small populations. And so in a small population, we have individuals with rare genotypes and there's only a few of them. And so in a small population, the, uh, the probability of those rare genotypes being passed on um, due to mating is going to be less. And so the rare genes end up not being passed and you end up having this homozygous um, population. And so genetic drift changes the genetic um, the genetic diversity, and in this case, in a small population, it decreases the genetic diversity in a small population. In large populations, there's a greater chance for individuals with rare genes to mate. So we have this random mating, and then we have this increase in the rare genes. Uh, so this causes diversity to increase. The bottleneck effect, it's called this because um, this is due to population size decreasing. And when the population size decreases, the ones that survive are totally random. Um, and so maybe it doesn't have anything to do with adaptive traits. Um, it really is just random, the ones that survive. And it could be due to a quick change in an environment that doesn't really allow for natural selection to occur. Um, and so our survivals, totally random, um, will go into a bottleneck. And they go into a bottleneck and then now they're only reproducing using that set of genes, leaving out any other set of genes that would have occurred in the population had they all um, been survivors. Um, fewer individuals means fewer unique genotypes. Low genetic variation leads to increased risk of disease, um, low fertility, lower ability to adapt to environmental changes, and that all leads to population decline. So remember that when you're trying to explain how something occurs, okay, what's going to be the effect of the bottleneck? Okay, it's going to, it's going to decrease pop, um, it's going to decrease population. Well, the question really is, what is happening in between? How is it in uh, decreasing population? The founder effect is the change in genetic composition of a population as a result of descending from a small number of colonizing individuals. And so this happens a lot with birds, where there's some migrating organisms uh, to a different location and the migrating individuals do not represent the whole population. So like if there's, bird, if there's in this example, red and white and blue birds, and there's a fruit fly in here, probably from Mr. Wojtek's classroom. Um, but anyway, if there's a red and a white and a blue bird, that's in our population, that's representing the whole population there's not going to be one of each going to to the island, okay? Just if we count for randomness here, there could be maybe one or two different types of those those genotypes going to the, the new place. And so we're going to see that population change um, in differently compared to the mainland population. So colonization of an island by a few individuals, and we're calling those founders, may give rise to a population that has a more limited genetic composition. And this is because they didn't bring the whole spectrum of genetic diversity to, uh, from the original population to the, to the new. So let's review these concepts here. Um, you should be writing down the, the, the sentence and filling in the blank as best you can. You should pause the video in between and I will show you the answers in a minute. Take a moment and answer the questions. All right, so how did you do? 
Number one, evolution is the change in the genetic composition of a population. Number two, macro evolution, or you could have said speciation, is when genetic changes give rise to a new species. Number three, genotype is a complete set of genes available, while the phenotype is a set of genes expressed. Remember, genotype codes for phenotype. Number four, a mutation is a mistake in DNA copying that can sometimes improve fitness, or you could have said adaptability, or um, survival, or something like that, survival and reproduction. Number five, the process of evolution that involves adaptive traits leading to increased reproduction and passing on that favorable gene is called evolution by natural selection. When humans choose the desirable traits of an organism to be passed on, this is called artificial selection. Isolation decreases genetic variation and leads to inbreeding, which results in a homozygous population containing unfavorable genes. Number eight, random mating causes genetic drift, especially in small populations. Number nine, we're looking for the bottleneck effect, which occurs uh, when the size of a population decreases and genetic variation is decreased. And number 10, the founder effect changes genetic composition of a population while colonizing individuals do not represent the full genetic diversity of the original population. All right, so that's it. I hope that you have a better understanding for how evolution occurs, and I will see you next time.